Good evening, everyone. Hopefully you're doing well. Um, and um, prayers to you and yours, especially those of us who may have family members that are in Texas, in the Midwest, so on and so forth. And even those of us in the great Pacific Northwest, hopefully that you and yours are remaining safe um, with this inclement weather and safe um, with this pandemic going on. Um, my name is Dr. Lawrence Rashid. I am the BSU advisor and I am the African-American Black Student Coordinator. About me, we have a great, we have a whole lot of superstars on this stage here tonight. That's what Run said. But um, this is not my house. Um, but we want to make sure we get into it. So um, glad you all could join us um, here at Lane Community College. We celebrate Black, Black History. Can I get the word out of mouth? Black History 365. And we're going to go into that a little bit later uh, with my brother who's going to speak a little bit about that curriculum. So with that being said, um, let's go ahead and go into, can we go into the um, intro video a little bit? <laughs> Thank you for that, Brother Carter. Um, always representing, um, just always representing um, and everybody. So thank you for that. Um, it's a perfect entree and, and, and interlude into what we're going to go into next. So I get the chance to talk about one of a musician, an MC, hip hop icon. Um, this next video, you know, people probably don't even may not even be familiar with KRS. But this song right here is a banger. And if you not, if you don't know, now you know, and I can't say the rest because Biggie Smalls will get me fired. But if you don't know, <laughs> y'all know the rest. Check out this video. It's fire. I told y'all uh, it was a banger. I told you all at Y'all slept on that? Get the whole album. It's, it's wow. Man, so with that being said, we're going to go to another brilliant brother who's a great colleague of mine. I had the opportunity to work with him with Rice of Passage, or I had the opportunity to reserve him with Rice of Passage, and he's just brilliant. He's doing a lot of great things over there at Churchill High School. Just, just great educator, great father, just the whole nine. Um, Show some love from Brother Gene Chisholm. Good evening, everyone. I'm honored to be here. Um, this is fantastic. Uh, once again, my name is Gene Chisholm. I'm the ninth grade transition coordinator at Churchill High School. Uh, this is year 19 in education. Next year's the big two zero, and I'm looking forward to that. But tonight I get to share 
a fantastic resource with you called Black History 365. Um, a colleague of mine reached out to me this summer and said, hey, I have a game changer that potentially uh, could change the framework of education. And in this curriculum, um, it's written by, it's written for us, it shares our history, unlike our other history books that we encountered in our school time. The curriculum is over 1200 pages. Uh, it's 10 units with 30 plus chapters. It starts in ancient Africa. It's engaging. It has QR codes that brings out more engagement with students. The curriculum right now is a 912, but it's really close to being a K-12 by the end of the uh, spring here. Um, it's fascinating. There is a, each chapter has a MC wrapping what the chapter is about. So it's really engaging. Uh, the, the chapters are produced, the, the music is produced by a, a Grammy award winning uh, um, producer as well. So um, once again, it starts in ancient Africa and it goes all the way to Canada and talks about the great migration and, and ending up with uh, our people in Canada. Also, it talks about John Lewis and, the, and uh, George Floyd. So if you have any questions and would like to see a more detailed uh, presentation, please reach out to Dr. Rashid and he will share my info. Thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you for that, Brother Gene Chisholm. So yeah, the Black History 365 curriculum, man, so it's, it's really on point. Um, and I think that's an excellent segue into our local griot, um, who's been doing some of this type of work for many moons now. And I need to mention he and his wife have been doing this work, uh, specifically here in the Pacific North Northwest, in the Eugene area, around our history, right? And he's, you know, I'm really thankful that he is, you know, my jigna, right? That term means mentor, but we don't use that term mentor all the time. But, and he's a friend and a colleague and a confidant and just he and his wife, they've kind of taken me in, um, fed me, not only nourished him, but fed my, my intellect and my spirit. Um, Professor Harris is, I mean, we don't have enough time to give him all the accolades, right? But when we're talking about curriculum in history in particular, we need to mention his name around these parts, um, especially. So without further ado, um, I'm going, I give you our griot, Professor Harris. Thank you, Brother Rashid. My wife, uh, my wife Sherry and I um, were talking earlier today about uh, the, the interesting times we're situated in. <laughs> and I just got off a Zoom call with the Lane County Medical Society in which I used a, the PowerPoint slide that basically has the caduceus and I introduced the caduceus as a symbol of ancient Kemet. And the subject was basically talking about uh, racism within medicine. And how is it that a multiracial, highly technical society that actually trains multiracial doctors can devolve into a pra practice of medicine uh, that discriminates against the people that created <laughs> the technology. <laughs> That's always a source of uh, irony to me. Um, our keynote speaker, uh, Anthony Browder, um, I've long admired his work and he definitely has inspired me 
um, in the class that I'm currently teaching and pioneered at Lane Community College along with uh, Rites of Passage and um, our project I2M Eugene, a multicultural history project, so not just Black, everybody that we've been an alliance from. And um, I start the class in 15,000 BC because I got tired of the 1619 thing. And we created a multicultural history project because our alliances with all those peoples starts way before 1619 and you need a context to talk about that. And I've admired Dr. Uh, Anthony Browder's work for a long time and it's been an integral part of my class. So he's an author, publisher, cultural historian, artist, an educator. Uh, he graduated from Mecca. Oh, oh did I say that? Oh, well, oh, Howard University. And uh, has led extensive uh, work throughout the United States and five continents. He founded and directed IKG Cultural Resources and has devoted 43 years of researching ancient Egyptian comedian history, science, philosophy, and culture. He's traveled to Egypt 60 times since 1980 and currently is director of the ASA Restoration Project, which I hope he'll talk about and kick some knowledge about that, which is uh, funding the excavation and restoration of three 25th dynasty tombs of Kushite noblemen on the west bank of Luxor, Egypt. He's the first African American to fund and coordinate archaeological digs in Egypt and has led more than 30 archaeological missions to Egypt since 2009. So he's been an author, co-author of 14 publications which are currently used in classrooms, definitely used in my classroom uh, around the world. And his three decades of study have led him to the conclusion that ancient Africans were the architects of civilization and developed the rudiments of what has become the scientific, religious, and philosophical backbone of humankind. So from this framework, uh, the IKG has concentrated its research and disseminated its findings. I give you Anthony Browder. Professor Harris, thank you so much, brother. I appreciate the introduction. I appreciate the fact that you are using my material in the classroom and together we are freeing minds that are prepared to be free. So uh, Dr. Rashid, thank you so much for uh, creating this opportunity for me to, to be on multiple coasts simultaneously. <laughs> I'm sitting in my home here in Washington, D.C. and speaking to you all in, uh, you're near Eugene, Oregon, is that, is that correct? Eugene, Oregon. And then we've got people all over the country who are tuning in. So I, I'm so grateful for this opportunity to share my knowledge with you. And what I'm going to do is to share my screen where I will use a PowerPoint and we will jump into the presentation and then Professor Harris will facilitate the uh, Q&A afterwards. And we will, let me get everything set up. We will jump into it. So um, tonight's topic is putting the African in Black History Month. And the best way I feel we can facilitate this process is by restoring the memory of African people. So tonight, uh, that's what I'm going to be zeroing on. We're going to look at the restoration of African memory. This process is so critically important because uh, the memory, the historical memory of African people has been erased and the erasure has been forgotten. So we don't know our past and many of us don't know that we don't know uh, our past. And so the process of memory restoration is crucial to us becoming the people that we were born to be. Uh, John Henry Clark, who was one of my teachers, 
uh, said that African history represents the missing pages of world history. And I would like to suggest that if African history were a book of a thousand pages, the story of our enslavement begins on page 996 and is only two pages long. And so it's critically important for us to talk about the first 995 pages so that we have context for how we got into the situation that we currently find ourselves in. Because as some have said, the past is prologue. And so I wanna begin uh, by looking at page 997 in this history book of a thousand pages. And I want to reference the words of Henry Berry Esquire, who is a member of the Virginia House of Delegates. He gave this presentation to other Virginia enslavers on January the 20th, 1832. And this statement helps us to understand why we are in the conditions that we find ourselves in today. Mr. Berry said, speaking to other enslavers, sir, we have so far as possible closed every avenue through which light may enter the slave's mind. If we could extinguish their capacity to see the light, then they would be on the level of the beasts of the field our work would be completed and we would be safe. Now, what he was talking about was using light as a metaphor to represent knowledge, education, and information. So their mission was to close every door by which we could retain knowledge of ourselves and that they wanted to extinguish our capacity to see the light so that we would live and function like animals. That was their job and they were interested in performing their jobs for their own security. So we have to begin to understand all the steps that have been taken in order to put us in physical prisons, mental prisons, and spiritual prisons. And so it is through the process of reading, it is through the process of understanding what we were not supposed to know that we can begin the process of freeing our minds. And one of the most significant personalities in that regards is an African Puerto Rican by the name of Arturo Schomburg, who in 1925 wrote a very important essay entitled The Negro Digs Up His Past. And in the very first paragraph of that article, he says, paraphrasing, that the American Negro must remake his past in order to make his future, must replace that which slavery took away. We have to think more collectively, we have to think more uh, retrospectively than others in this country, and we must become the most enthusiastic antiquarian of them all. We must restore what enslavement took away. We are the ones who should be reading and studying to restore our African memories. Now, Mr. Schomburg wrote this article in 1925. The following year, 1926, Carter G. Woodson established Negro History Week, which ultimately became Black History Month. Now, one thing that many people uh, get wrong about Black His Negro History Week and Black History Month or African Heritage Month is that they think that we have the shortest month of the year to remember the history of the longest living people on the planet. But that is not the case. Dr. Woodson showcased, specifically showcased one week in the month when young African children could demonstrate to their teachers and their communities what they have been learning the other 11 months of the year. So it's not a focus simply on February, but February was the showcase. It was the opportunity for you to show what you have learned, show the knowledge that you have mastered. And in 1933, Dr. Woodson wrote his seminal work, The Miseducation of the Negro, in which he states that every person has two educations, one that is given to him or her, and the other which they must give themselves. And he said that the latter is by far more significant because everything that is important in a person's life is that which they must seek out for themselves because that constitutes your real education. So it's about restoration of memory. These concepts are repeated over and over and over again. And so I have to acknowledge uh, Ivan Van Sertema for putting me on this path on February the 21st, 1977. I heard Dr. Van Sertema speak at Georgetown Law School 
and he had just written a book entitled, They Came Before Columbus, The African Presence in America. Now, Dr. Van Sertema was thorough, he was brilliant, and in his presentation, he shared images of Africans who, na who navigated the Nile River, the Mediterranean Sea, the Atlantic Ocean, and had numerous exchanges with indigenous people in Mexico between 1200 and 600 BC or 2,500 years before Christopher Columbus was born. And then he provided evidence and showed pictures of some of the statues of these Africans who he described as wearing a Nubian style headdress and said that these Africans were from the Nile Valley. Now, my mind is blown. My mind is blown. I had the pleasure of traveling to Mexico with Dr. Van Sertema twice in 1990 and 1991 to visit all of these Omic heads. And some of the heads are seven feet high. The largest is 15 feet in diameter. These are the images of Africans who were known as the Omex, who were part of the ruling class in Mexico for hundreds of years. And they left these images all throughout Mexico. They inspired the creation of the calendar, architecture, engineering, cosmology, and religion, which helped to jumpstart civilization here in the Americas. But what really impressed me the most of all of the incredible things that Van Sertema said was when he said, that these black men were Egyptians and that the Egyptians were black. This was the first time in my life I ever heard anyone say that the Egyptians were black. And this information contradicted everything that I had read in every book prior to 1977. It contradicted every movie I'd seen on television, uh, specials and documentaries. So my mind is racing now to begin to uncover what I now refer to as forbidden knowledge. And so tonight, I dedicate my presentation to four men who put me on this path. Dr. Ivan Van Sertema, Dr. Yosef Ben Yekinen, who I first traveled to Egypt with in 1980, uh, Dr. John Henry Clark, who I met in 1981, who just taught me the value of world history and African history, and Dr. ACG Hilliard, who showed me how to synthesize all of this information and present it to my audience in such a manner that anyone can receive it. These four men have served as the, as the cornerstone of my cultural consciousness. They are responsible for the person that you're looking at and listening to right now. So I didn't get where I am by myself. I followed in the footsteps of giants. And so what I would like to do is to share with you what's coming, share with you information that will be in the second volume of African world history. And this second volume is built on four foundational truths. Now, one of the things that I learned from Dr. Van Sertema was that one should never talk about anything in public that you can't validate with at least four sources. Always have your sources. And so the primary source for these four foundational truths that I'm going to share with you now are in the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. They're part of a $20 million exhibition that tells the truth that our children's children will be learning and will become second nature to them. And those fundamental truths are one, 300,000 years ago, Africans were the only human beings on the planet. Two, 60,000 years ago, Africans populated East Asia. Point three, 40,000 years ago, Africans populated West Asia. Now these ideas were expressed in what was uh, referred to as the out of Africa theory. This theory is now accepted as a scientific and historical fact that Africans are the mothers and fathers of humanity. And as we find out later, the mothers and fathers of civilization. And the fourth point is 6,000 years ago, civilization began in the Nile Valley. So the reclamation of the Nile Valley as a part of African people, African history, African culture is essential to the restoration of the African mind. And so we will find that most of the names that we use to describe the country known as Egypt are foreign names. This pyramid that you see here, pyramid is a Greek word. Sphinx is a Greek word. Egypt is a Greek word. 
So this nation and the objects created by the indigenous people in this nation are now referred to by people who live over 3000 years after indigenous African people created this culture and civilization. So another crucial component in the restoration of African memory is to restore African names. So the African name for the pyramid is Mir, a word that means place of ascension. The African word for Sphinx is Her El Maquette, a word that describes the son of Asar and Aset, the founding parents of Kemet, which is the original name for the country that the Greeks renamed Egypt. And so when we look at the Nile River Valley, we, we're looking at the longest river in the world and the only river, the only major river in the world, which flows from south to north. The Nile River begins up south near Tanzania and Uganda, flows through, the water flows through the White Nile, and then there's another tributary that begins in Lake Tana in Ethiopia that leads to the Blue Nile, and these two Nile rivers join in Khartoum and form the singular Nile Valley, which flows through lower uh, Nubia, or lower Sudan, into upper Egypt, and then lower Egypt. So the elevation goes from a higher elevation to a lower elevation. So from the Kemetic point of view, from the African point of view, from the Nile Valley point of view, <clears throat> South was up and North is down. So the way that we orient ourselves today has literally turned our world upside down. Africans, the first human beings on the planet related to the land of their ancestors. They used the Nile River as the world's oldest cultural highway. And so the gods originated in the South, up South. All of the major components of culture and civilization began up south and migrated northward down the Nile. This is what the historical record shows very clearly. And so for the past 40 years, I've been studying this information and finding creative ways of making this information accessible to people with the greatest need to know. And as was mentioned in my introduction, I've been studying Egyptian history for 44 years now. And what has allowed me to be fully engaged in this process is the fact that I've been self-employed for 42 years. I can create as much money as I want in order to pursue the things that interest me. And what has interested me for the last uh, 44 years is learning my African history and culture. I would buy books, read books, and then go to meet the scholars who wrote those books and cultivate and deepen my understanding of African history and culture. I've made over 70 trips to Africa. 60 of those trips have been to Egypt alone within the past uh, 40 years. I've authored or co-authored 14 books which are now being used in school systems throughout the United States and around the world. And we have been excavating tombs in Egypt for 12 and a half years. When we first began the Asa Restoration Project in 2008, we had three tombs that we were excavating and restoring. As of December of last year, we now have eight tombs. So the Acer Restoration Project has taken on a life of its own. I've been taking groups to, to Egypt since 1987, and we've probably taken well over um, 600 people to Egypt on these study tours. And the purpose of the study tours is to help restore the memory of African people by walking them through Kemet in the Nile Valley and picking up the pieces of our historical memory so that we can understand who we were, what we've done, and what we have the capacity to do now. My most important trip to Egypt occurred in 1989 when I took my then seven-year-old daughter. I saw that I was responsible as a parent, as a single parent, I assumed responsibility for teaching my daughter her African history. I was not going to allow a school system which has a history of miseducation to miseducate my daughter. So I took her to Egypt so that she can see why her father spends so much time talking about the Nile Valley, traveling to the Nile Valley and traveling around the country, talking to people about this information. So we looked at the great temples. She came to understand her history and her culture. 
And more specifically, she had an opportunity to meet the descendants of the people who created this grand history and culture. She interacted with the Nubians. And in this picture here in the lower uh, left-hand corner, you'll be hard pressed to distinguish my daughter from the indigenous people of this ancient land. And so the point that we have to understand is that Egypt is in Africa and the civilization of Egypt is an extension of Nile Valley culture and civilization. It is our legacy, it is our history and culture. So upon returning from my daughter's first trip to Africa, we wrote a book about her experiences so that other children could have an opportunity to learn about their history through the eyes of a child. And so every time my daughter travels to Egypt with me, and she's probably been about 15 years, 15 uh, times now, every time we go to Abu Simbo, we take a picture of her standing in front of uh, the temple of, of Ramesses II at Abu Simbo so that we can document her growth uh, since 1989. And you know, her experiences have been extraordinary in that when the book was first published, when she was eight years old, she was at that time in 1991, the youngest published author in America. So National, National Geographic for Children did a story about Atlantis. And over the years, she has traveled to Africa, other countries in Africa and written books about her experiences. So again, young African-American children who may never have the opportunity to travel to Africa can learn about their heritage through the eyes of one of their contemporaries. And one of the beautiful things about exposing children to African history at an early age is that it unlocks the genetic memory locked inside of them. So as a child, they begin to see their history right in front of their eyes. My daughter was raised here in, in Washington, DC. And so when she saw the Lincoln Memorial, she said, dad, that's similar to the temple of Ramesses II at Abu Simbel. And I said, well, yes, Daniel Chester French, the sculptor who carved the statue of Abraham Lincoln in his temple had traveled to Egypt and had seen the temple of Ramesses II and had always wanted to create something of that magnitude in the United States of America. And he was given his chance and created this image of Abraham Lincoln that mirrored the image of Ramesses II in front of his temple, which had been created around 1250 BC. And then she looked at the Washington Monument and said, dad, you know, the monument and the reflection pool, we saw that in Egypt, didn't we? We saw that at Karnak Temple. There were over 10 Tekkenu in Karnak Temple and every temple in Kemet had Tekkenu, which are now referred to by their Greek names, obelisk. Every temple had Tekkenu and every temple had a sacred lake. So the architecture of Washington DC was inspired by the African architecture and engineering that began in the Nile River Valley. So we claim, we reclaim our history, store our memory by studying ourselves, by becoming the greatest antiquarians in this country. She even looked at the symbols on the back of the dollar bill and said, dad, you know, why is there a pyramid on the back of the dollar bill? She knows that there are 118 pyramids or mirror. In but when she went to Sudan with me in 2016, she learned that there are over 400 mirror in Sudan. And so the pyramid that you see on the back of the dollar bill is not an Egyptian pyramid, it's a Kushite pyramid. And it speaks to the fact that when the Great Seal was created in 1776, George Washington and his cohorts were attempting to recreate Egypt in America. That's another lecture which we can maybe deal with maybe next, next February. Even the front, the symbols on the front of the dollar bill were inspired by the national symbol of ancient Kemet. One of the beautiful things about restoring your African memory is that once that memory has been restored, you now can look anywhere in the world and find traces of your ancestry that have literally been hidden in plain sight. So this idea of looking at your history, 360, is what the restoration of our memory is all about. Even the Oscar, the highest award given by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences 
was inspired by the statue of Batar, who is the patron saint of artists and craftspersons in Kemet. People know us better than we know ourselves, and they use that knowledge in order to lift themselves up. So it's critically important now for us to reclaim that which was erased, reclaim that which was illegal, and begin to rebuild our legacy wherever we find ourselves. That is the mission of every African person who knows who he or she is. So Professor Harris, in honor of your request, I wanna talk about the Acer Restoration Project. I've come now to fully understand that this is the project, this is the work for which I was born. I'm doing my best work in my life working with the Acer Restoration Project. This project was named in honor of my dear friend, A.C. Hilliard, who wrote the introduction to my very first book from the Browder file uh, 32 years ago. Dr. Hilliard was a true Jegna and he died at a conference in Egypt on August the 13th, 2007. His sudden death came as a shock to everyone who knew him and loved him. And one of the things that I learned from, from Asia and, and, and Lynn Jeffries and Rosalind Jeffries and, and Dr. Clark and so many of, of my heroes and sheroes is that Africans understood that whenever someone becomes an ancestor, we are obligated to name things after them so that as we call their name, we give them life. We give them life so that they can live through us. And so that is the reason why you name streets and buildings and institutions after ancestors, because you want to remember them. You want to keep their memories alive in your consciousness for future generations. So in 2008, I had the opportunity to become involved in the most important work of my life. And that is the excavation of what was then three tombs, three Kushite tombs, three 2,700 year old tombs on the West Bank of Luxor, Egypt. And I decided to name this project the Asa Restoration Project in honor of my colleagues. So I want to share with you some of the highlights of my 12 and a half years of digging up our past as Arthur Schomburg suggested that we do. I took him literally at his word. So here is an image, an aerial shot of two of the main sites that we have been restoring, the tomb of Karakamen and the tomb of Karabashkin. These tombs are 2,700 years old. They represent noblemen of the 25th dynasty who lived in Egypt, who lived in Luxor and governed that city and restored the temples and monuments there and also restored some of the most important rituals in the history of ancient Kemet. These tombs were built out of the living limestone bedrock, some 20 feet underground. And in the instance of Karakamen's tomb, um, the ceiling of the tomb collapsed in the 1990s. So what we had to do as we excavated his site was to remove over 20,000 tons of debris. And during that process, we uncovered over 34,000 fragments, which we are now using to rebuild this temple tomb of Karakamen. But 11 years ago, in August, 2010, we found Karakamen's burial chamber, which was some 60 feet underground. Here's a photograph taken of my daughter and I in this burial chamber which had already been robbed by its contents, but we spent a week, just the two of us, 60 feet underground, excavating in this space and finding some incredible things, having some very serious daddy-daughter time and talking about why it was that the two of us are doing this work together. And one of the things that I've always done, every time we find a new tomb at this site, I always make it a point for my daughter to enter the tomb first so that history records 
that my daughter, Atlantis Tai Browder, was the first African-American inside of these tombs. That is how we are making history, and this is the history that we're documenting. In the tomb of, Kar of Karaboshkin in 2016, we found his sarcophagus. And as we took the measurements of this sarcophagus, we found that this object <clears throat> measured eight feet high, five feet wide, 12 feet long, and weighed an estimated 20,000 pounds. It is made of rose granite, which is a stone that it is only quarried in Aswan, about 100 miles to the south. And it is a stone, rose granite is a stone that is only used for members of the royal family. So while we don't know a lot about this man, Karaboskin, who was an architect, who was the mayor of the city of Wasset, the city that we now know as Luxor, we don't know a lot about him, but slowly but surely, the more we find as we excavate in this area, the more fragmented pieces of his historical narrative we can put together. And as we put these fragments together, we can begin to construct a historical memory an accurate historical memory of this man who lived and died over 2,700 years ago. We've also had the pleasure of organizing two conferences in Luxor where we brought together other archeologists, other Egyptologists who are also working in Luxor, excavating tombs, specifically tombs of the 25th dynasty. So there is information that has been uncovered over the last 100 years that has never made its way into the history books. And so we're about to change that now as we begin to publish information that releases this, these findings to the general public. So I spoke at the last conference we held in, on September the 25th in 2016 in Luxor, Egypt. And I talked about the significance of the work that we're doing. We are, as Professor Harris said, the only people of African descent who are funding and fully participating in an archeological excavation in Egypt. In 2019, the Egyptian government issued 240 permits for foreigners to excavate in Egypt. 239 of those permits went to non-African people. So we are making history. And I wanna share with you some phenomenal things that occurred during this conference. At the same moment, at the precise moment that I was giving my address to the attendees at the conference, 6,000 miles away in Washington, DC, at the exact same hour, history was being made when President Barack Hussein Obama was opening the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Now there are some direct connections to this that I'm gonna come back to a little bit later on. But I also wanna share with you an important element which changed my life forever. Three days after the opening of the conference on September the 28th, 2016, I made a discovery in North Assasif that profoundly changed my life in that I visited two tombs in North Assasif, two 2,700-year-old tombs. And as one of only two African-Americans who were walking inside of these tombs, I observed something that nobody else saw. And the only reason I recognized it was because Dr. Clark and, and Dr. Jeffries, Dr. Hilliard and others had restored my memory so that I could recognize what was hidden in plain sight. What I saw painted on the ceiling of two tombs was this symbol. Now this image is not crystal clear, but here is a recreation of that image. Some of you who are familiar with the history and culture of Ghana will recognize this symbol as one of several Akan symbols that represent the phrase, the concept of Sankofa. Sankofa, an Akan word, which means that it is not forbidden to go back and to reclaim the knowledge of your past. Now, I was floored 
singing this tune suggested to me that somehow Africans in the Nile Valley had carried their cargo of knowledge from the Nile River Valley to the Niger River Valley. And so I found, and as, as I'm doing research now on this very important discovery, I found that there were many ancient lakes and rivers that linked the east coast of Africa to the west coast of Africa. And if the Nile was a cultural highway, which allowed Africans to navigate from the south down north, then we see that these ancient Africans were also able to navigate uh, using water systems from the east to the west. Now, if Africans could literally walk out of Africa into Asia and around the world, out of Africa into Europe, they certainly could have built, uh, created boats and navigated from the Nile to the Niger. As a matter of fact, there's a very important book written by a colleague of, of Sheikh Abdesjaw, a book entitled Paths from the Nile, written by Abubakar Lam, in which he documents the work of several Senegalese scholars who documented this historical fact. There are Africans in Senegal, in Gambia, Nigeria, Ghana, Mali, who say categorically that their ancestors came to the Niger River Valley from the Nile River Valley and brought aspects of architecture, of spiritual traditions, of astronomy, of philosophy and medicine to the West Coast of Africa. So this has opened up a whole new field of study, which hopefully over the course of the next decade or two will have dozens of scholars expanding on this work. This is brand new, uh, a brand new field of study that we have to begin to examine. And so what this new information does is open new horizons for us. So we have to pave the way for the scholars who will build on this research, the scholars who will begin to trace the path from the Nile to the Niger, and then also trace the flow of African people from the Niger to the Potomac, to the Hudson, to the Mississippi, to all of the river valleys in the United States of America where our people worked and slaved. So this then becomes an important component to helping reconnect us to West Africa and to East Africa and see the cultural unity of Africa which Sheikh Antijope wrote about in the 1950s. And so this symbol, the Sankofa symbol that I found on the ceiling of tombs in Egypt, the Sankofa symbol that is still being used in Ghana today is a symbol that is also used by conscious people of African ancestry in the United States. Do you all recognize the, the photograph of this man? Uh, Professor Harris, do you know who this brother is? Not sure. Uh, Dr. Rashid, you're in the music, you're in the hip hop. Do you recognize this brother? Yeah, I think it's brother Quest Love. It is Quest Love of the Roots. Yep. Who is the director of the house band for the Tonight Show. You see that emblem on his jacket? It is the Sankofa symbol. And that is the symbol that graces the African burial ground in New York City. That is the logo for the African burial ground, right? So we're making connections now that we can now trace back to West Africa, to Ghana and Ivory Coast, and then take it all the way back to the Nile Valley, where I have found that this symbol originated, the oldest examples of, of this symbol, which is called a uh, running spiral pattern, has been found on a piece of pottery that was created in Kush in the 17th century BC, all right? So this is an important part of our story. So moving forward, coming into page um, 998 in this book of African history at the National Museum of African American History and Culture, this symbol is inside of this museum. 
And it reminds us what Kwame Nkrumah reminded us of, that we are African, not because we were born in Africa. We are African because Africa was born in us. Africa is in our DNA. We carry within us the DNA of Africans, Homo sapiens sapiens, who lived over 300,000 years ago. We carry their genetic memory within us. Inside of the National Museum of African American History and Culture, they have a display which talks about the Adinkra symbols which are used in, in Ghana and the Ivory Coast. Adinkra means saying goodbye or farewell to the dead. Adinkra implies a philosophical message that one conveys when mourning during a funeral or, or post burial memorial. So to find the same symbol that is used to honor the dead painted on the ceiling of two 2,700 year old tombs in Egypt says something about the migration of African people, African knowledge and African traditions from the Nile to the Niger, now to the Americas. We are remembering, we are reconnecting with our ancestors. And so when you come into this museum and I would encourage you all to come, but you have to come with knowledge because what this museum does is drop you down into the beginning of our story, beginning with enslavement. It doesn't say anything at all about who we were before our world was turned upside down. It doesn't talk about the, uh, the earlier 992 pages of our story. So without that background, you may be lost or you may be angry upon learning for the first time how our people were oppressed and abused. But anger is not what gets us through. It is knowledge which inspires us, knowledge which transforms our consciousness. One of the most significant areas in this museum is an exhibition that is referred to as the Paradox of Liberty, where you will see the words of Thomas Jefferson inscribed on the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson, who is standing on a pedestal and greets you when you um, step into this hall. He says that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. But whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends of, of, of issuing inalienable rights, it becomes your responsibility to alter or to abolish that government. That should be our mental declaration of independence. But this exhibition also speaks to the paradox of liberty. All men are created equal in the United States, except black men and women. That's a paradox. How do we deal with that paradox? We address that paradox with knowledge of our past, accurate and complete knowledge of our past. So in this exhibition, they tell you that 12 of the first 18 presidents of the United States of America enslaved Africans. They tell you in this exhibition that the 609 blocks that you see behind Thomas Jefferson contains the names or are inscribed with the names of the 609 Africans that Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States owned, including six of the children by he uh, that he fathered was Sally Hemings. This is the paradox of liberty that we have been dealing with for 401 years. They also go on to say in this exhibition that the importation of enslaved Africans ended on January the 1st, 1880. So January the 1st, excuse me, 1808, January the 1st, 1808, the United States of America stopped importing Africans, but the enslavement of Africans continued until 1865. And so there's a crucial understanding that we must achieve. What happened to African people in America between 1808 and when we were freed in 1865? And there is another exhibition that simply states that
that the domestic breeding of Africans as an enslaved population exceeds the number of Africans, stolen Africans who were brought to America. And I want you all to understand that. I want you to grasp that reality. More Africans were bred like cattle in the United States of America after 1808 than were brought over here from the continent of Africa. And less than a hundred miles from where I sit this evening on the Eastern shore of Maryland and just North of Richmond, Virginia, you will find two of the largest slave breeding farms in the world where millions of African men, women, and children were bred like cattle. That is part of the American story. That is part of American history that must be told in order for us to resolve this paradox of liberty. We've got to free our minds with the truth and not become angry, but become empowered to begin to restore our historical and cultural memory, restore that which was illegal, and then do what we've always had the capacity to do to build a new world. We understand now that America has become the wealthiest nation on the face of this planet because of the forced enslavement of African people. That is the debt that Randall Robinson was talking about. That is the debt that members of NCOBRA who are advocating for reparations have been talking about for decades. And so if you were to go <clears throat> outside of this building, you'll find symbolism embedded in the architecture in the corona or the, the brass-like metal uh, which covers the exterior of the National Museum of African American History and Culture, you will find symbolism that connects Africans in America to Africans in the Niger River Valley and Africans in the Nile River Valley. The architect, David Ajay, who designed this building, this Ghanaian architect who designed this building, created the exterior after being inspired by a, a Nigerian shrine post, a Yoruba shrine post. And so you see these three tiered trapezoidal shapes were the inspiration for the top of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. He's making a direct connection between Africans in America and Africans on the west coast of Africa, where many of our ancestors were taken. You will also find that the upper, that the angle of the corona was designed to an angle of 17 degrees in order to match the 73 degree angle of the pyramidion atop the Washington Monument, the symbol that represents Asar, the founding father of ancient Kemet. So for those with eyes to see and those with a restored memory, you now can look at this structure and see that the architect, this Ghanaian architect is making a direct parallel between Africans in America and Africans in the Nile Valley. As a matter of fact, David Ajay referred to Washington DC as Karnak on the Potomac. And he went on to say that at its best, Architecture is the physical manifestation of a culture's highest ideals. And those highest ideals were ideals that sprang from the minds of African men and women who lived in the Nile Valley and developed the oldest documented civilization known to mankind. I documented this story in my book published in 2005, Egypt on the Potomac, where I show all of the parallels that led to the creation of the United States of America in which these men were inspired by the best of the architecture, symbolism and mythology that had been developed in the Nile River Valley. And so as I wind down, I want to refer to my teacher, John Henry Clark, who talked about the importance of history, who said that history is the clock that people use to tell their political and cultural time of day, who reminded us 
that history is the compass that people use to find themselves on the map of human geography, who told us that history tells a people where they have been and what they have been, what they are and where they are. But the most important role of the reclamation of history is to remind the people where they still must go and what they still must do. Because all history is a current event. And Dr. Clark reminded us that if you begin your history in slavery, then everything since then looks like progress. So we have to go back to the source, reclaim our African mind, and restore those things that were illegal. So I want you all to take a screenshot of this photograph. We're currently working on a display at the Thurgood Marshall Center in Washington, DC, where the IKG offices are. And this display is going to be dedicated to the legacy of John Henry Clark. And one of these displays will document um, essential reading for Africans of the 21st century who want to actively be engaged in the restoration of their historical and cultural memory. We've got 10 books by some of, some of our greatest scholars, Dr. Clark, Dr. Hilliard, Drusilla Dungey Houston, George Jim James, John Jackson, Dr. Ben, Van Serdma, Francis Wilson, Chancellor Williams, Carter G. Woodson. I've got books here that should be in your library. Books here that should be studied and not just read. Books that are essential tools for the restoration of your African consciousness. These are some of my books, which should be in your library. Three of these books were co-authored by my daughter so that we have information for young children. Your children are never too young to begin to know who they are. They're never too young for you to instill a sense of pride. And that pride is a pride that helps them understand that you cannot teach 3000 years of African history in one month. That pride should remind them that every month is African Heritage Month and that we celebrate our history using curriculums that teach us to be African 365 days of the year. So with that, I'm gonna bring my presentation to a close by reminding you that we are the vessels through which our ancestors breathe, speak, and do their best work. I am Tony Browder. I restore tombs, I revive ancestors, and I restore the memories of their African descendants. So with that, I'll stop the screen, the screen share and I'll turn the mic over to you, Professor Harris, so that we can do a uh, Q and A. 300,000 years of African history is almost too much to do in uh, 11 weeks, but that's what I'm <laughs> doing now. So thank, I'm glad that uh, most of the books, actually all of the books that you have uh, portrayed are in my 150, volume book list for the class. So thank you for that validation. I have, um, I have a question about um, if you're going to begin with one book, what would that be? My favorite book one of the first books that, that I read, my African history Bible, is John G. Jackson's Introduction to African Civilization. Okay. <laughs> John Jackson, uh, I mean, he is, he is a brilliant man uh, and he has the ability to convey complex ideas in a very simple, easy to digest manner. I love him, I love his work. I love that analogy about if uh, African history is a thousand page book that slavery starts on 997. Not I got six. Don't cut it short. <laughs> <laughs> I really get tired of the 1619 thing. Oh yeah. Well, you know what I've done is I flipped it. Um, I said, if folk want 1619, they can have it. 
give me 16, uh, 1619 BC. 1619 BC, the pyramids were already a thousand years old. We had already built uh, great temples and monuments. Uh, Africans had already established a colony on Greece. You know, so perspective is everything, man. Context is everything. So we have to assume responsibility for forgiving our people what uh, the larger society is not prepared to let them have. Well, the first question um, is, can you please go over the four fundamental truths one more time? Okay, uh, real simple. Um, one, now this exhibition, which is located in um, the um, Charles Koch Hall of the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. This is uh, Charles Koch of the Koch brothers, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, even a broken clock <laughs> twice a day, right? Um, this exhibition was financed to the tune of $15 million. It's an incredible exhibition that shows you the evolution of, of, of man. And so in the original ex exhibition, which is about um, maybe 12 years old now, the data says that 250,000 years ago, Africans were the only human beings on the planet. Well, since that exhibition was open, new data has come out, which has pushed that time frame back to 300,000 years ago. They also have a timeline which says that 60,000 years ago, Africans in East Africa, which is where we find the oldest skeletal remains of Homo sapiens sapiens, begin walking out of East Africa into Eastern Asia and began populating Asia, walked across the Bering Strait and began to walk into uh, Canada, North America, Central America, South America, and, 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 and populated the Caribbean. They also went on to say that 40,000 years ago, another group of these same Africans in East Africa walked westward into Western Asia, the landmass that we now refer to as Europe. So if you process just those three pieces of information, what it means is the first people in Asia were African. The first people in Europe were also African. Another important piece of information, which is not in this exhibition, but what came to light about three years ago when a group of geneticists identified when the genes of Africans the melanin of Africans in Europe mutated and they became non-Africans, the people that we now classify as Europeans. And these geneticists, white geneticists said that this gene mutated somewhere between seven to 8,000 years ago. So if that is our place marker, then what it means is Africans as homo sapiens sapiens have been living, breathing, creating on this planet for at least 300,000 years. And Europeans have only been here for seven to 8,000 years, which means that Africans have a 292,000 year head start on Europeans. So that's where our focus should be, documenting that history, the oldest history known to mankind. And as you said, uh, Professor Harris, uh, it is from that history that multicultural history emerges. Because as John Jackson says in the Introduction to African Civilization, he dedicates that book to the human race, which began in Africa. And there is no such thing as race. Race was a false construct that was created by racists in order to divide people by color and to assign the lowest uh, classification of intelligence to the people who had the greatest amount of melanin in their skin. So that lie has to be turned upside down, has to be abolished, and we have to restore um, the memory and the legacy of our ancestors to its rightful place. John Jackson's uh, book again. Introduction to African Civilization. Okay. And the introduction to Introduction to African Civilization was written by John Henry Clark. And here's an interesting aside. John Jackson taught John Henry Clark. John Henry Clark and John Jackson taught Dr. Ben. 
And in <laughs> September of 1989, I had the pleasure of hosting these three giants at a two day symposium in Washington, DC. Uh, that was entitled uh, The Elder Symposium, which was a mind freeing two day experience. There's a question uh, in the Q&A that want to know how they can uh, participate in the uh, archeological work. Sure, uh, a couple of things that they can do is uh, they can go to my website, Matter of fact, give me a second and I can pull up um, that information that they could either take a screenshot of or copy. Here are our, our social media uh, handles. If you're interested in supporting the Acer Restoration Project, uh, we are a 501c3, uh, a nonprofit organization, so that all contributions to the Acer Restoration Project are tax deductible. Uh, our budget has has grown from $40,000 a year in 2008 to last December uh, was our most successful season to date. We found four new tombs and our budget last year was $150,000. So one of the ways people can support the Acer Restoration Project is by making a tax deductible contribution. Uh, we are at the point now where we have finished most of the um, the excavations and we're in the restoration phase where we have a greater need now for technocrats, architects and engineers who can help us build a roof on the um, ceiling of Karakamen's tomb and to help us uh, build up the, um, the superstructure of these tombs so that when we open this site and our projected opening date is in 2025, uh, people will be able to travel to Egypt and they will be able to see uh, the first Kushite tombs who, that were excavated and restored by African-Americans. So this is what the, uh, the Acer Restoration Project is doing in real time. And anyone who wants to be a part of this history making endeavor can go to our website, which is ikg-info.com and see details on how they can become involved with the project or how they can travel to Egypt with us on one of our study tours. People uh, are curious about uh, one of your favorite books on the bookshelf behind you, assuming that's not a set piece, but, okay. but I know it to look like yours, it ain't. <laughs> it ain't there by accident. Uh, they're curious about the books. What's, what's, uh, what are they curious uh, about? One, that one book they said. Uh, what book is that? Did they? Oh, uh, they didn't say. Oh, wow. they just see a bunch of books there. You know, it's like, right? I've got Ivan's, you know, on my bookshelf. Uh, Aunt Francis's uh, ISIS papers. Uh, oh, a uh, bunch of black psychologists. <laughs> well, he, here's here's two books. Here is a a hard back copy of Introduction to African Civilization, which John Jackson gave me himself when I visited him. Uh, he was living in Chicago at that time. Uh, but here's another important book that came out, I think in around 2012. It is uh, one of the most uh, complete books on ancient Nubia. So the work that I've been doing um, uh, since 2008, restoring these Kushite tombs uh, is allowing us to restore one of the least documented epochs of Nile Valley history and culture. That is the 25th dynasty, which most Egyptologists refer to as the Negro dynasty, uh, which is the furthest thing from the truth. Uh, but uh, this book is entitled Ancient Nubia, African Kingdoms on the Nile. It, um, it has some of the most current information about ancient Kush and the discoveries there. And you'll find in that book maps that indicate that there are over 400 pyramids in Kush. There are more pyramids in Kush than there are in Egypt. Mm. Uh, a question from my nephew in LA. All right. Um, he's uh, referring to Chancellor's destruction of black civilization, indicating yes. that our history 
predates ancient Kemet by thousands of years. Can you speak on this? Sure. Uh, well, chapter and, two, uh, I think it's chapter two in introduction in um, um, Destruction of Black Civilization uh, refers to Egypt as Ethiopia's oldest daughter. So <laughs> what I know, I've been to Ethiopia twice. I've been to Sudan once. What I know is that that civilization, the civilization of Kemet began in Kush and Kushite civilization began in Ethiopia, Abyssinia. Uh, and there needs to be archeological work done in Kenya, in Tanzania and Uganda, which are the sources of the white now. And I guarantee you will find elements of this ancient civilization up there. So, uh, and I also had a good friend of mine, um, uh, Haile Garima, who lives and works in Washington, DC. He created- Sankofa. Sankofa, absolutely, a, a genius film. Uh, he said that, um, you know, he, he, he kind of pulled me aside one day, and this was about, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago. And he said, Tony, you and Asa, you all need to stop talking about, about Egypt so much. You got to go to Ethiopia because that is where all of this started. And I, I kind of laughed him off until he shared with me um, information about the Ereche, Ereche ritual, which is conducted every September in Ethiopia. The Ereche Rich Festival is the festival which is, for all intents and purposes, the story, the Ethiopian story of the Asarian drama, where the Ethiopian version of a set goes searching for the missing parts of her husband's body to restore her husband. And that story has been practiced in Ethiopia for over 10,000 years. So the true source of Nile Valley civilization can only be found up south. And that's where we have to begin to start digging. We've got to raise at least three generations of, of African archeologists who would do that work. Question from the chat. Uh, definitely germane for our times. How do you all navigate as an archeological nonprofit organization and the adaptation of having to work under COVID uh, regulations in your current and future projects, especially under the extreme conditions of a different land environment? Well, uh, truth be told, um, excavations in Egypt is not that hard. The hardest thing about the excavation is raising the money to do the work. We've got over 125 men working for us. They get paid every Thursday. And these men, these um, Egyptian men, many of whom have lived their lives on the West Bank of Luxor, uh, these men regard us as family. And as a person, of, as, as an African-American male, born in Chicago, living in Washington, DC, I can tell you that I am safer in Egypt today than I am in my own country. Uh, and that COVID protocols were in place this past season. Uh, we give masks out to the workers every day. There is uh, a greater degree of social distancing as they're working at the site. We take their temperatures and we do the best we can uh, to manage this. And, um, and that is what we will continue to do until this work is done. We worked in Egypt uh, throughout three revolutions that began um, 10 years ago. Uh, and on, on two occasions, we were the only foreign mission excavating in Egypt. We were one of only three missions who excavated in Luxor this season. Everybody else dropped out because of COVID. So the Egyptian mm -hmm. people know what's in our hearts. They know that we are serious. They support us. They protect us. And I might also add that the ancestors are also there to protect us as well, because they know that we're there doing good work. The chat is getting deeper and deeper, my brother. <laughs> now we're getting into environmental racism as uh, an educational art project. Um, Jason Wallace is an artist currently interested in the subject of water 
as a possibility of trauma for black and brown diasporic people in America. Uh, originally started uh, investigating Flint, Michigan, uh, the natural resource of water relating to access, resource, and class. Please share any books that might point me in the right direction. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have any information. I don't know everything. Uh, and if I don't know uh, something, I would tell you I don't know. But I have, uh, I have been working in Flint uh, for over 20 years. I go there regularly to conduct workshops, uh, to, to teach uh, certain segments of the community, African history. And Flint is still devastated by the crime of uh, diverting water from the Flint River to, um, to, the, to the people of Flint. And, and that's, that's a crime. And those people need to be held accountable uh, for their crime. But I would refer him to a documentary uh, called Happy, H-A-P-I. It came out last year. It's a film that looks at the Nile River, which is also known as Happy. Happy was the name for the Nile River when it flood. And they look at, they look at the economy, the economics in the Happy River Valley, which influenced the economy of the world. So I would um, refer the, the student to, to look up that film. They can type happy film on YouTube. They have a host of, of interviews and programs that they've done. So he may find a source there that may lead him to uh, some answers uh, to the question that he posed to me. The uh, electronic gig we had uh, last month with Dr. Bullard, who uh, has also been doing seminal work for the last 40 years in environmental racism. Uh, if you send me, send an email to harrism at lanecc.edu, I can send you the link to that talk because we recorded that as well. So we were dealing with water, land, all kinds of environmental racism, pollution and solutions. So that can work too. The African article, the African artifacts found in Mexico, are they from the land migration or from the navigation across the Atlantic? They are primary from um, the navigation across the, um, um, the Atlantic Ocean but there's also evidence of um, cultural exchanges, cultural influences. Uh, there is a phenomenal museum uh, in, in Jalapa, Mexico, an incredible museum. And inside of that museum, uh, they have one of the largest collection of the Olmec heads. And they openly acknowledge the role that these Africans played in jumpstarting civilization in, um, in, in, in Mexico, what we now call Mexico. As a matter of fact, in I think it's chapter eight of my book, Now Valley Contributions to Civilization, I have um, a couple of pages dedicated to Van Sertima and uh, some of the findings that he has brought to light as a result of his work in, uh, in Mexico. There was a request for you to give a shout out to uh, someone who's currently studying your Nile contributions, Nayela Iman. A right. request for <laughs> <laughs> a request for a shout out. Well, listen, I extend an invitation to you to participate in a master class that I will be conducting uh, beginning in um, next month. Um, you can go to our website, ikg-info.com. I'm going to be doing three courses examining um, Nile Valley contributions to civilization, uh, going over that content and adding supplemental information, new information. That book is 29 years old. So uh, there is a ton of new information that I want to, to share with the participants of that class so that we can have a deeper understanding of the Nile Valley and begin to reclaim the legacy of Kemet. Uh, there's so much inaccurate information about ancient Egypt, which is one of the reasons why many, many African Americans uh, aren't interested in Egypt. They believe the misinformation. So we have to supplement that information with historical truths that are documented so that we can free the minds of everyone who is ready to be free. 
that's a good place to stop. Take us out, Dr. Rashid. Wow, 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 wow. Um, you know, I, I, I've witnessed this brother, I think about three, this is my third time, and familiar with the scholarship, but he's always seems to impress. You know, so I'm always learning something new. Um, for those of you who were here, you got a treat. Um, just phenomenal. Thank you, Brother Browder, for blessing us with your just your wisdom. I mean, it's just off the charts. Um, definitely want to thank, you know, Professor Harris for facilitating the Q&A. Um, Brother Gene Chisholm for, you know, enlightening us about the Black History 365. Um, our BSU. I want to thank everybody behind the scenes. You know, Randy, Deontay, Rory, I mean, everybody, um, you know, that made this possible. It, it was just phenomenal. Um, I want to shout out a few see, things. I proceed. One thing, because I don't want to get you in trouble. Uh, we would be remiss if we did not acknowledge Deborah Watkins. Oh, uh, <laughs> no, 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 sir. I'm <laughs> not only am I going to acknowledge my maternal jigna, I'm also going to reference you all to visit a bin another black educational network. Make exactly. sure you go to that website. Um, just phenomenal resource, so much information. And soon as the flyer is available for the Stanford Institute, I'm gonna make that available to us because it's such a great resource. Um, you have the likes of, you know, Tony Browder and other rock stars who are participatory in that, you know, Stanford Institute. I mean, it's phenomenal. So. You know, Deborah, you know I love you. Miss Deborah Rockin is phenomenal. And I couldn't, I wouldn't be the person who I am if it wasn't for her. I mean, she's that impactful and she's, you know, I'm indebted to her um, just so much. So I want to make sure you all know a couple of events we have coming up real quickly. So we have our Tiny Tight Summit where we're going to have our special host author doc, by the name of Dr. Khalid White. His work is phenomenal. Um, make sure you tune into that. The information should be on our MCC website. If not, you know, I'll make sure I get that to you. Um, that's going to be phenomenal. We had a great event last year. Looking forward to doing it this year virtually. And then mark your calendars. March the 12th, Dr. Tommy J. Curry is going to be in our midst. So you definitely want to be there. Um, he's going to be doing a talk on the... Um, the stratification of racialized males during COVID and the importance of black male studies. And yours truly is going to be teaching a black male studies course um, next term. So definitely register for that. I mean, it, it's, it's going to fill up quickly. So thank you all. Thank you for spending your time. You could have been any place else this evening. I know you want to watch the Laker and Nets game. So, but thank you for being here and getting us knowledge. Um, God bless. Good night. Thank you, brother. Take care. Thank you. Peace. We'll be in touch. Mm -hmm. All right.